Hello everyone, today we talk about the Holy Roman Empire and more specifically about the role of Auctoritas and Potestas in the Renovatio Imperi. So um, this is going to be um, a bit of a theoretical video in practice, although I'll, I'll try to, to ground it on mm, actual mm, historical examples and phases, especially in the um, <coughs> in the construction of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, I wanted it uh, initially to be an introduction to the um, ideal, the mm, to um, an introduction to the ideal of the Renovatio Imperi carried out by the Ottonian dynasty. But then I thought that mm, it's a little, mm, it's probably mm, <coughs> um, more helpful at least. Um, and even more interesting under a uh, certain point of view at least, to discuss um, the actual mm, ideal standing mm, behind the uh, the Holy Roman Empire itself, that at the time wasn't even called Hol as Holy Roman Empire, that is something practically um, came um, uh, came later, um, as well as the, um, the the following of the Germanic nation, that is something that I, I, I discussed about, telling the truth, just um, a couple of videos ago when when discussing um, princely Germany I mean, during the 14th uh, and 15th centuries and how the progressive withdrawal of Germany from the Mediterranean brought an end and uh, to the universalistic uh, ambitions of um <coughs> the uh, Germanic monarchs and generally speaking to, to, to a Germanization of the, the empire in turn. Um, although uh, it was never a complete Germanization because indeed the empire maintained its um <coughs> universalistic um I mean, it was a Germanization in, in practice, but in theory, um, and the, the ideal of the universal empire was, was still out there. And you can argue that it even survived uh, the Holy Roman Empire at a, po uh, at a point. Um, um, I in the West as well, I mean, even Napoleon, that was starting on completely different bases, was actually stressing the, the importance of the um of the auctoritas and the potestas <coughs> together with the in the ideal of imperium in the way of um, in the way he could seize the crown after all we 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 reason as if the holy roman empire was practically a german empire uh, also ideally but it w it wasn't definitely or at least w uh, whether if um this key interpretation was definitely stressed by those populations like the franks uh, or later the saxons that um had their own uh, empires in practice, and uh, were still conceived as universal empires, and on, on ideally, at least, they they tried to 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 let it pass it in, in this fashion, uh, the correspective uh, uh, the cor um, corresponding to the um, the Roman Empire uh, of the East practice in its western half. Um, and um, <coughs> these are actually very broad topics to discuss, so today I would like to tear it down to um, really um, the, the conceptual origins of the, um, of the Holy Roman Empire, um <coughs> even before it was called in this way, practice. Um, first of all, mm, w what is uh, evident in the Holy Roman Empire, even on the surface for anyone that, that has not, not think about it, and, and the main difference with the Roman Empire proper is that while the Roman Empire was uh, formerly a state, with a, uh, at least at this time during the Middle Ages, with a, we're talking about a Constantinople, with a um, autocrat, mm, so it, it was basically a monarchy, but it, it was still a monarchy at the that was at the head of a, s of a centralized state, independ independently from the the actual mm, praxis. Then, because even the the, mm, the Byzantine Empire underwent uh, um, s certain <coughs> to a certain decentralization, but that that already existed in practice um, in in every uh, other political. Mm, uh, entity at the time. I mean, uh, even the Roman Empire of the uh, 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 of its peak, let's say the early Roman um <coughs> during the Principate, let's say, 
uh, it was decentralized in some fashion. It wasn't this monolithic um, style machine that we we like to 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 identify as if it was a 19th century uh, nation state, because this is uh, usually the fashion in which we reason today, uh, uh <coughs> relatively to the past. I mean, especially people who have. I think the Middle Ages are extremely important to 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 have a completely um, different mindset really relative relatively to these topics, and. Um, and also because I think that our times today are going, are growing at least much more similar to the medieval ones, in terms of um, the overlapping of um, uh, of political institutions and uh, um, the um, and the relation with communities and all, then <coughs> and then really going further to uh, a strengthening of the nation state. Um, which is something evident that you can see from globalization, but also from from the mere fact that um, the the same nation state has difficulties to to actually control even uh, uh, the um, well. L let's not bring this too far, but l because it can be also debatable on on, on other grounds. But wh what I say is that. <coughs> a great difference between the the, um, the uh, let's say the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. Let's call them in this way because other uh, so, so we 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 know exactly what we're talking about at this time in history. Um, um, the um, is that the 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 mm, the Holy Roman Empire was basically a sum um, of uh, basically the imperial crown in itself, together with other royal crowns. Mm. I mean, the idea that in order to be a Holy Roman Empire you had to be first King of Germany, then King of the Romans, then King of Italy, uh, and, and eventually uh, being crowned by the Pope in Rome for, um, in order to achieve the imperial uh, crown was I is something that obviously wasn't, wasn't there in the East. Obviously, even there it was a very strict connection but uh, between a state and church, but of a wholly different kind, um, and in a much more, um, in, in much less ambiguous way, by the way. Um, it was much more functional, I mean, even the succession problems were, uh, were you know, the Byzantine Empire actually had I its own f problems also in, in the political practice in this sense, um, <coughs> but at least there was a, um, a um, an institutional system to which the the various political options were well framed conceptually speaking aside from minor changes that definitely occurred uh, uh, um, throughout the world history of the um, of Constantinople but uh, in the West you see that um, this was overly complicated um, and it all derived from mm, dynamics that I think that if, if you go check uh, the medieval Germany playlist you can find full of of information relatively to that so we don't have to explain why all these stages of of crownings before eventually getting to 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 the Empire but uh, even w without looking at those um, you can easily understand that the uh, the Holy Roman Empire was a much weaker thing in practice throughout all its history than the uh, uh, the, Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire as uh, as a Roman state. Mm. Um, then obviously also the Byzantine Empire had its crack in the 13th century and but that's well in our story. I mean obviously Constantinople was conquered. Uh, there were a lot of substantial changes but it, that those were times into which basically after which in a short while, even uh, the Western Holy Roman Empire would have mm, mm, would uh, eventually fragment into a myriad of other smaller powers that were formally, however, into this f federal uh, system that that remained up mm, and that kept actually influencing very heavily uh, European history for not just for the rest of the Middle Ages but also uh, throughout the modern uh, the modern age and the few. Um, yeah, and the few life that it had during the contemporary one, before it was taken out by Napoleon. Um, but um, the mm, the in order to understand this um, 
the the Holy Roman Empire, especially after, uh, but but also during the um, the Carolingian uh, the Carolingian dynasty, it's essential to distinguish, um, just like the ancient Romans did, between the concepts of um, auctoritas mm -hmm. <coughs> and potestas. Um, the the two terms are um, um, actually very um, uh, very difficult to ex uh, th they can't really be uh, translated in authority I mean authority is seemingly obvious but um, these are the, the, they have all um, very um, very difficult um, et etymologies even um, to for instance authority comes from the uh, Latin verb augeo that was uh, the same that has the same etymology of Augustus, mm, w which means to aggrandize, to um, to strengthen, to to honor, to to um, even to to enrich, even from a sort of uh, life li like a um, uh, like a sap, you know, and um <coughs> and therefore it had a, a very important um, um, and, and by by the way, in medieval times it was also used in different ways. Potestas is a bit com more complicated because theor theoretically um, you can uh, translate it in English as well as authority, just like authorities, but th actually the, um, the, the meaning is very different. It's more um, reasonably translatable with power, as a matter of fact. So you, in, in a nutshell, the, um, authority, the difference is that authorities means the having um, the um, was something that gives you the right to exercise power, so I, it's something that can be also potential, mm, it can be theoretical, it can be abstract in practice, and reason as if, in, indeed, uh, in these times, the abstraction was out there, because every all, all of these concepts were um, thought in a Christian fashion, so um, they were strongly linked to uh, theology, to the idea of the divine, to the reflection of the uh, mm, divine authorities into the, the earthly one. So um, these kind of metaphysical meanings were literally out there as um, as a, as a as a picture of the world. Uh, I mean, it, it's something that that really gave the world the meaning that went just beyond earthly things. While potestas basically means the exercise of power in itself. So it's um, there is a difference like this also. Interestingly, in the Islamic world, even if on mm, with with diff very different um, approaches to to this, but uh, it's still very interesting that uh, there is this similarity. I believe um, because even in the Christian sense, in the uh, of the um, Western Empire, uh, these definitely had um, very um, very different exceptions in practice. Now, why um, why really mentioning these names? Because um, in the West, even in those moments into which uh, there was the strongest, uh, the stronger uh, eclipse of public power, think about um, indeed after mm, uh, previously to the Carolingian, uh, the Carolingian Empire in itself, uh, or during maybe the, the fall of the Hohenstaufen or during those dynastic crises that occurred um, throughout all the Holy Roman Imperial history, or after the, the end of the Carolingians as well, other big uh, uh, vacuum, let's say, of, of uh, imperial authority. The, the idea that a sovereign authority was necessary to legitimate a power um, uh, that I in practice could be exercised more or less without the, the simple use of force actually ne ne never came, um, um, never disappeared. Mm -hmm. and this is very interesting because when you reason about the, the actual origins of the Holy Roman Empire it sounds like <coughs> you know, uh, it was an invention, 
like I know that there are lots of uh, of debates uh, on the internet between the I don't know the Germanists and the Byzantinists um, I've seen people really tearing themselves apart on this <laughs> on the net and I've always found that like you know if you have those memes about people eating popcorn like the, the show has just began I mean do you 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 can't really um, sit there and have the time <laughs> of your life uh, reading the the hatred that certain people can have still today about empires that are over from centuries and and that by the way tells you how still these concepts are are are, are conceived to be pretty meaningful even in, even in our times and probably especially in our times where in, into which we 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 definitely realize that the nation state is declining and therefore we we're, we're looking at something greater that can uh, mm, substitute it in some fashion in europe we have um uh, obviously the European Union that, uh, you know, the, the opinions about which vary from uh, a <laughs> totalitarian dictatorship to, I mean, the the, the, the most, uh, uh, the purest and most uh, liberal and, uh, and uh, likable thing ever ha happened. I I kind of lay in the middle actually. I'm I'm a Euro Europeist myself, but I, uh, what I'm mostly interested in uh in, in in a video like this is really to to tell about the ideals that are behind the, the idea of Europe. Uh interestingly, it's because of characters that weren't even um continental Europeans or maybe they weren't even Europeans uh, that the the concept of feudal federal um federal Europe was was out there you know European federalism was born in in uh, in England um, the Americans also formulated together with um, you know their own um, you know the, the example of the US you know just do something like you the United States of Europe as well founded on our, our same um, uh, principles ideals and historically speaking we created something very different by the way there is a very great big difference between what um, the US achieved and what uh, you know came out of the French Revolution and I say that we're still paying uh, the cons the consequences of this um, <coughs> Um, because of that, I don't want to take away anything from the, you know, civilization achievements of civil, uh, uh, um, juridical, intellectual achievements of the French Revolution. But definitely, you can argue that um, from that path, maybe the other one would have been even worse. We don't know. We we don't do alternative history here. But um, definitely, things like. Um, World War I, World War II, at least, and many other things actually came out from it. And, and that is not over yet. I mean, we are still living in that world, in, in, in that idea of state. Um, so, uh, the fact that we are still looking so, uh, and still debating so hotly about, you know, who was, like, the wh what was actually the original empire? I mean, everybody, I think, agrees. Uh, um, uh, agree on on the uh, the idea that the, the Roman Empire was something important, but I'm at least uh, between those that are debating between uh, you know Germanists and Byz Byzantinists. But there are people who say simply even we we don't like the Roman Empire. We we want a different way of of conceiving politics, institutions, and all. And definitely in in Europe we have different traditions. <coughs> than than the Roman one. Mm, the Roman one is being really pushed much by the Enlightenment uh, for obvious reasons, because the Enlightenment was simply pushing for towards the nation state, um, and, they, and and at that time they they conceived the Roman Empire like something like that practically, um, not maybe as a nation, but definitely as a state. Um, and um, but there are other models that I believe also gave life to, uh, in part, to the Holy Roman Empire and characterized it differently from the Roman Empire proper. Uh, now, wi with this statement, <laughs> I just basically uh, said from from which side I lean. Let's say towards. Uh, I believe, obviously, from a juridical point of view, at least, that the Roman Empire was. Uh, I mean, the Byzantine Empire was definitely the 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 real Roman Empire and the Holy Roman one something slightly different but I'm not gonna make a fuss about this in the sense that I also like the Holy Roman Empire as in its, uh, as itself I uh, in itself and um, 
I have really nothing against it, especially in my videos. I I, I don't I, I don't see the point of taking sides really, but that was just an example for saying you know where the thing was born and and definitely I think that the Holy Roman Empire was born in um, however in a sort of romantic ideal and um, and yet genuinely honest um, continuity with the uh, the Roman Empire proper. And we have to understand this really from the perspective of those who created it, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. And this is what we're trying to do today. Um, so practically, um, the um, the um, uh, if, even if you think about the feudal system, hmm, that was like the apotheosis of uh, the uh, privatization, we can say. We, I, I've talked extensively about <laughs> this. I think I've bored you uh, enough. Mm, if you look in, in my Carolingian um, Europe playlist, I, I definitely talk only about that. I think every video I made about the Carolingians uh, is touching this issue about how, you know, especially in post-Carolingian times, how the whole thing got completely privatized al almost and how even genetically speaking in the Carolingian Empire the, the real nature of the public was really meant as privately. Mm -hmm. Too many things to tell at once, I don't know how this video is going to turn out. But um, just to make an example, f feudalism mm -hmm. that in this sense is conceived on the idea that there is a private something private at the base, at the same time was ruled, was practically kept up because the thieves, uh, the beneficia mm, in Latin, were entrusted to the, the, the privates by public powers. I mean literally um, this really really happened also in other times and spaces in history. I mean you, you take obviously if there is a public power still standing and you uh, you you seek for legitimization uh, it, it's pretty stupid not to 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 ask that to to make it so i mean um but it's still very meaningful and and uh, and beyond just um utilitarism that that uh, um, not all not just kingdoms post uh, mm, the 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 former carolingian kingdoms but also the same um, empire survived institutionally speaking, in a moment in which there was no concrete centralized authority of that kind. And this was in part caused, I believe, by the same um, absence of authority. And there is this eternal debate on how, how, you know, how much the state should take away from personal freedom in order, for, for the sake of, gov of practically making everybody safe. I mean, I uh, even uh, the, the greatest uh, those who mm, the, the greatest advocate uh, advocates of um of of uh, the um, of liberalism um uh or mm, basically uh of liberalism meant uh, canonically speaking not like the liberals like the you you call them in the United States um <coughs> i mean liberalism as a, a as a political and economical philosophy um say that i don't know we need the police for instance and the police implicitly means that there is someone first of all we have to pay for that police mm -hmm. and secondly there is someone that is armed with other people's money and can abuse of that power so there is uh, at a theoretical level, at an abstract level, sometimes too many times, unfortunately, in political debate, uh, this continuous, uh, mm, you know, clash between those who say, you know, that things have to be more or less balanced. But it's obvious that there has always to be a sort of state into which you have to set things uh, well, because. After all, um, I, I'm not saying that there is something teleological in history, but if you see how the world basically expanded, um, it expanded towards uh, a centralization in practice. Uh, this happened obviously passing over the, literally the, the corpses of millions, um, uh, and, uh, and this is very sad to acknowledge, but at the same time it's the mean through which civilization was made. I mean, uh, how do you think the Roman Empire was built? It was built on the uh, the the slaughtering of uh, millions of people, 
the enslavement of other hundreds of millions of people and uh, and that's really it uh, and and the continuous sla uh, slave work of those people who built up wha what we can see today uh, even still at two thousand years of distance and uh, we still appreciate the Roman Empire right nobody actually comes out and says you know R Roman Empire should be banned from our memories, from our monuments and all, because it was based on slavery. We we obviously are not, um, at least l luckily by now, we're not still uh, <laughs> posed in front of that challenge. And um, uh, yet it, it is a bit true. I mean, it is indeed uh, something we, we, we usually rationalize it in, in a fashion like saying, okay, yeah, it was pretty bad thing, but at the same time, it, it's from that that we 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 uh, from those bases that we we, we had the, the chance eventually to to do better mm, and to progress into civilization and um and you can't uh, you should uh, at least i used to, to respond in this way because i don't think that judging uh morally history itself is i mean you can judge m history from a moral point of view but to me, um, the idea is that the, the the real problem is to to really understand history in the first place. And since there is definitely no time in a single life to to even came in, uh, to even come even remotely close to understanding um, a tiny fraction of history, maybe it's better it, it's time better spent to try to understand things and then to judgment. So <laughs> postponing um, part of greater part of the judgment at least. Uh, uh, for the sake of learning new things, which in in practical terms really helps people much more than than judging without knowing. Um, but aside from this, uh, which is also kind of an extremistic, uh, it's kind of a paradox more than else. Um, it, it's pretty obvious that the I, I, in feudal Europe that there was still it was really still felt the need that a public power should stand out there and to keep um a sort of uh, of control by the way on on the same people who were supporting that idea because if you are a feudal lord and there is a, a, a stronger feudal lord that can eat you up like the small fish uh, the big fish with a small one well uh, you're you're definitely obliged to stress the fact that there, there has to be a control from a from a sovereign authority for for these things not to happen and uh, same should go the, the other way around. I mean if you were uh, if you really are the one instead with, with maybe uh, eating someone else up which by the way in feudal Europe um, was um, daily business <laughs> in both ways for, for every feudal lord in practice. Um, so um, uh, uh, although um, the um, there is, um, in this sense, also um, the um, the permanence, together with the with the public, of a sort of fixed um, private uh, property, which I, which I uh, which is the uh, so-called allodial one that you can translate with private practically, and sanctioned actually by feudal feudal right. Uh, that was also very uh, hotly debated uh, in, in at some points, but that is very interesting because it basically says that um, not everything really belongs to the state. Mm. Um, while in the Roman Empire, in practice, um, everything kind of belonged to the state. I mean, not really in the in the practice of things, but the state had mm, possibly a um a boundless um ability of intervening mm. um, especially we're talking about the to the times into which the, the roman empire had become something much more centralized and you never arrived to anything close to to a direct control on ev of everything simply because the technology didn't w didn't cons didn't allow that but in theory, if there is an absolute monarch like the Roman Emperor of the uh, Dominatus practi practically is, uh, basically you can't really own everything. If you take, um, for instance, 
um, certain parts of, uh, of Byzantine Italy, especially the ones that were under the control of the popes, that were using Roman law, by the way, at a certain point you notice, for instance in Rome, that the popes had managed to, to claim property on old land that existed. So that in practice uh, didn't really mean much different from, from other places. But it, it was still the idea that whoever people built, um, uh, they, they, they carried out their, their business and all, the Pope could arrive and claim uh, to take a part, obviously, um, uh, of the revenues, like let's say. Obviously, wi with a limit that was a political one, because uh, the Popes weren't, um, even in Rome, the, the only uh, absolute monarchs are really out there, at least in the Middle Ages. Uh, but uh, the uh, the idea is that the, if the the land is public, so it can be taken away from a certain point of view. He said the, the, the idea of a private core of things that you cannot touch definitely was out there into feudal rights. The devil extended also in, in, in papal territories. So it's something very complicated. Now I don't want to get to uh, picky with and um, cavillos with um, with these details about which I don't really even know uh, excessively much. But just for saying that um, this really stands uh, in practice in a in a different conception of the state that existed between uh, the Germanic culture uh, that de definitely stressed freedom as a value because the Germanic peoples had had been um, um used to live in in, in such uh dear and environmental and environmental conditions that they hadn't uh ever developed something greater than um than a tribe uh in, in terms of political centralization. The, the Romans lived in a completely different fashion, so they had a, a much stronger coercive uh, push from the state. So eventually the feudal right is something that is, is really of, of Germanic origin, if you want to if you want to tell it all. Uh, but definitely was also conjugated uh, into this um, um, idea of public that was attached to the empire. Um, that was of Roman inspiration. And the interesting thing here is that the obviously the guys that were at the top in the Holy Roman Empire definitely stressed the necessity of taking Roman law and applicating that. Like Charles the Great was obviously being um, Charlemagne, he was inspired by, aside from the from Judaism that he terribly loved, also in terms of bloodsheds and uh, against the enemies of the faith and all, um, the Carolingians really had a, a, a very strong better testamentary influence. They thought of themselves to be the new Jews, the new chosen people, like just like the Jews and the Romans had felt themselves to be. Um, and because they had the imperium, they had actually the, bi the ability of, of submitting, because that came from God. But definitely, at a certain point, the, the, Carolin the Carolingians uh, understood that when, when, when they stopped expanding, in this sense, the story is similar to the Roman Empire, that they couldn't hold uh, the empire through the, um, the means uh, that they had uh, created it. That is, this continuous private clientele uh, regenerating and um, getting, in turn, um, uh, the, the new lands conquered and administrating from a central authority. They, they understood that if they wanted to, to preserve the empire, th they had definitely to centralize, to create something stronger, something more permanent. So they bet on the horse of the church, because it was the one with, with a greater education, a greater knowledge of, uh, of uh, actually, of the Roman law that was used by the church. Uh, in, in, in let's say in practice, even though we, in here we, the, the, char the church was a big thing, so it's not that in, in every place they used that thing, but I, I, and in fact the, the whole thing failed because also the Car Carolingian church was practically uh, just the, the ecclesiastical branch of the same uh, nobles that made up the, the lay clientels. Um, but if you think even at Frederick Barbarossa that made a freaking huge deal in order to, to, to re uh, established the empire to strengthen it. He was, in this sense, it's fascinating. Frederick, uh, from one side, imported um, 
the uh, feudalism to Germany, the feudalism of French model, that was in this sense the the acme of uh, France at that time was the most successful mm, political mm, entity in Europe. So feudalism really was also a key partly to that. I, it's a double-edged sword, but it definitely functioned. R from the other side, he, he tried to compensate this um, uh, you know, s um, centrifugal push of the feu feudalism that could allow military readiness, but also it kind of brought to, to, to some sort of um, um, of, of other risks, like, you know, feudatory is getting too powerful, with Roman law, therefore taking all these uh, jurists from Bologna, from, from, from all the, uh, the, the Italian universities that, had, that were recovering Roman law in that very moment in history, and, and using Roman law to say, you know, this uh, doesn't, you know, this is like, sh like the real law of the Romans, of, of what the Holy Roman Empire should be. Uh, relatively to the Barbarossa, this was overly complicated by the fact that um, he uh, Barbarossa was recovering Roman law um, on the base that the Church had began to develop um, uh, uh, next to Roman law uh, an idea of sort of divine law on its own that was claiming obviously power on the emperors and also. Um, Barbarossa was kind of taking a uh, part of the Byzantine uh, legacy for saying, uh, look at the uh, what the Theodosian uh, and, and Justinian code uh, w was really about. Here there is no, uh, I don't know, archbishop commanding over an emperor, so that was also the, the sake. But it was also for the sake of really trying to centralize, to give a sort of statal um, structure to the whole, to the old Roman Empire at that time. Um, the, um, um, and, 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 and it failed because eventually the, the, uh, so the things got rough, the, the, the dynasty got in, in trouble, mm, the son of Barbarossa died, Frederick himself eventually um, you know, he, uh, he he had been defeated by the Lombard League. I mean, the whole idea of the Western, big Western Empire, that exactly under him could really win, uh, and u unifying East and West, even at the point, Henry VI came close to, to actually marching to cons towards Constantinople, um, put an end to that, and, and there was a uh, fragmentation that you can argue, at least in Germany, um, um, started started really from there rather than from um, then from the, the end of of of, um, of the Owen stuff and after the death of Frederick the second because um, I at that point you you know the balance was shifted towards Sicily it was an all another uh, conception uh, together with the imperial one of course but a different strategical situation but aside from this um, the uh, what do you see, basically, w w when the, the Carolingian Empire declined, what you see is that these um, post-Carolingian aristocracies began to to fight over these royal crowns, like the one in the, in the Western Franks, the Eastern Franks, the, uh, the, the Italian crown, um, even the Burgundian one and all. Um, and um, two, um, and that that were really um, meaning f uh, meaningless in practice. Like, let's leave, uh, leave aside the fact that um, you know, let's see w where they happened. I mean, in Italy, there was never like an Italian kingdom in practice. Burgundy was bought as a kingdom. The Western Frankish kingdom um, was about to do the same end, you know, the, the, the Capetians eventually made it to, to transform it in what it became. Even the Saxon dynasty into the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, yeah, kind of, mm, you know, revived, it kind of renovated in, indeed the empire, but it's not that they ever came close to, to even close to, to control the world of Germany at, at all. Um, so I in this sense, also the fact that the the Eastern Frankish monarchy became remained an elective in practice meant that it was never strong power, not even at the heyday of of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, uh, 
when guided by a single um, by a, a powerful ruler we can say so the the um, the, the real thing was obtaining um, and because getting these crowns uh, could even equate not to actually have power really because the real power was based on I don't know your your feudal estates your military retinues your your actual material uh, power huh? so the <coughs> yet the, the these crowns conferred a, a dignity and an authority that at least in principle and therefore from a juridical point of view uh, couldn't really be ignored into that world and anyone who wanted to ch to, to get that cr those crowns knew that uh, um, uh, after having gotten them um, um, he, um, um, he he even if um, uh, having after having gotten it and even if he he had not had the actual um, uh, power um, he um, he had some prerogative in, in practice he could I don't know exercise justice on a certain level he could and and there was uh, in, in this fragmented political politically fragmented picture definitely always someone that in order to fight against his neighbor his enemies um, would always uh, see the crown as a point of reference and therefore automatically conferring a certain quote of authority a certain quote of power to death mm -hmm. there were also pressing things you know things about think about the uh, the age of the second invasions I mean both in uh, I mean all over both in France and in Italy th there was a considerable effort uh, from the Carolingian and 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 powers and even those who, who, who came later to kind of put still things together in the name of the ancient uh, public institutions mm -hmm. like making an army raising an army it was uh, making a, a, a long say a regional scale campaign it was really something you could do if there was really a king there uh, having a uh, some kind of control over these things and, and kind of assuming the responsibility uh, and 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 th there was warfare uh, all along this time. So even think about the rise of the Ottonians actually came because uh, Germany was being ravaged by uh, by the Hungars, uh, by the Magyars. So um, there was, it especially from a military point of view, and here the concept a concept of imperium was really what counted here. The w you know conferring military power. Mm. So conferring uh, really the the power of waging arms of, of leading armies uh, and th of public armies and th this is important because everybody had their own military retinues their private um, bands of thugs that could but you couldn't really uh, defeat an enemy army with those you had to build up something greater mm. and uh, and this was really a tradition that already existed. I mean, the Roman state obviously had it because, uh, uh, you know, even in the ancient days of, uh, of the old Latium, uh, the, the, the idea is that w this was this bunch of Indo-European tribes that put together to wage uh, an army against the, the local um, rivals. And so it was like in, in, in the Germanic world when uh, everybody hated um, kings, uh, the Germans couldn't stand them normally, um, but when um, uh, when times of war came, there was the the obvious necessity to to elect someone who would lead an army, mm. because if you have uh, one thousand men that are all divided in one hundred le military leaders, you can't really do much with that with them. They only work even if there are the same amount of men. If you put one guy in charge, hoping that he's obviously a good commander, and usually people in those times were, <laughs> were at least elected because there was a real problem there it's not like uh, we do today that we, we go voting f on base of sympathies or uh, I don't know or stuff like at the time 
mm, communities were really aware of what the 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 costs and benefits uh, and w what the issues really were. You know, if if, if Germany is being ravaged by the hungers, uh, th there is really not much you have to think about. You obviously need an army to defeat those guys, uh, because you can't do otherwise. And um, and this is how the these are, let's say, the factors that brought to the um, to the continuity of a public uh, institution, uh, um, and I stress public in here, not because it had to be in inescapable or th there had to be some some fate that had to to make it necessary, but there had been those institutions in the past, and the idea is saying why should we lose the opportunity of using that as a tool. For the guys in charge, it was definitely a political mean of self-promotion and of uh, that they could exploit in many ways. For the other people, it was like you know uh, that that is a, an easy channel. It uh, or it already exists from a juridical point of view that, that we it can help us also internationally speaking in terms of prestige. And you know, let's keep it alive. Uh, and so it, it really was. So if you were especially um, uh, before we made the example of the uh, weak monarch, but if if you were a strong monarch and you managed to get the imperial crown, you know, who could practically oppose, um, at least juridically, your prerogatives? Uh, because you can't still take arms against that guy, but uh, that guy can, uh, at the same time, uh, um, mint coins, maybe, and that is actually uh, uh, very, uh, you can't mint coins even if you're not the emperor. But one thing is doing it on your own. One another thing is doing it with a structure that let we can call a statel that maybe has already some kind of infrastructural base at one point, and that is uh, this tool. And at that point, uh, uh, what you do if you are his competitor is really aiming at taking his place. So even if you knock him out, maybe you create mess in the whole kingdom, you're still at least strengthening the concept that those infrastructures have to be kept alive in order for someone else uh, to come out, c to come there and ensure the continuity of that rule, maybe hoping to, to be the one to be <laughs> at the top at that point. Um, and there is also another very fascinating topic that I don't find very much um, discussed in popular culture or even um, that that is the um, really the previews um, f uh, you know the, the I don't know how to call it properly but it's it's as if there was a uh, an imperial legacy already mm, into intrinsically to, to 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 the Frankish Empire from the time of the Merovingians um the um uh, if you take 6th century europe what you have is basically um a few um romano germanic kingdoms uh including the one of the franks but the only difference is that the one of the franks is extending its power its power over other peoples other kingdoms or say sub kingdoms or maybe duchies and all had the way they had been degraded <laughs> uh, maybe um, but also at that time th th was the, the even the the actual differentiation between Rex or dukes what wasn't really or commas what wasn't really clear in in part and and what you had is is that this huge Merovingian Empire or you think about at the time of Clovis there was actually a, a, a force to be reckoned with um, at that time, the Longbirds were still struggling to create their own kingdom. The Visigoths were in Spain, uh, mm, kicked out b from, from from southern Gaul by the same Franks. And they didn't. They weren't. The, the Visigothic monarchy wasn't even. Mm, it wasn't that weak, but it was growing weaker, definitely. Um, and there weren't many others. Were the Anglo Saxons? There were just a bunch of, uh, of small lordships uh, in continuous war against each other. Uh, then these um, other Germanic populations scattered into Germany. 
Um, so the even Byzantines acknowledged that the Merovingians were this unique, very big and very powerful um, entity that existed in Europe, and they had um, actually granted to them the Vicary of Gauls for the Roman Empire. And Clovis, if I'm not wrong, had been sent even a uh, purpurous uh, mantle with the imperial insignia. I, I don't remember exactly by whether the mantle was the case, but in, in the Merovingians really adopted that as a legacy. And the Merovingians especially weren't like the others, uh, <laughs> the other um, Romano-Germanic um, um, actually, they were, they were a dynasty that was something very different from what existed in the other Romano-Germanic kingdoms. Um, because there was definitely a father-son succession at, at one time, also in the, um, in the uh, partly sometimes uh, in the Romano uh, into the Lombard, Lombard Italy, if, if, even, if, even if that wasn't the norm. In Visigothic Spain, it was kind of more marked. But in no Romano-Germanic um, place there was anything like what the Merovingians did. That was basically knocking out all the major Frank, uh, all the other Frankish aristocrats, putting um, on um, themselves basically on the throne as Merovingians as a dynasty, and splitting the kingdom as if it was a private domain of that dynasty. This would have never been accepted in places like Italy or Spain. Uh, nor in, um, I mean, there, there weren't really other big Romano-Germanic powers of such kind. There were smaller dynasties, I mean, if you take the Bavarians, that were, however, sort of um, practically of sub uh, Frankish um, political entity that had even created more as, in the sense, artificially, that it's not that the Bavarians are, were a, a very strictly ethnically defined people um, and they weren't definitely powerful at all um, but um, I mean the Merovingians were really um, and in, in this process the Merovingians were really taking ideologically any kind of tool that they could use to centralize over themselves and if you think about it even the the early Carolingians they, they were acting as masters of palace not really overthrowing the, the Merovingians it was just because of the papal intervention that they were sanctioned as um, kings of the Franks because there was still the idea throughout all the um, interseen strifes that had basically destroyed the Merovingian Empire um, into which the the, the real uh, discriminating factor was the Merovingian blood, and this led to awful things in the Merovingian Empire, including uh, you know the sons of the various Merovingian brothers, like uh, maybe mm, like children mm, mm, killed, like breaking their skulls on, on rocks just to, to 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 ensure that they wouldn't succeed to the throne. Um, and which is something unknown, I don't know, in uh, among Lombards, for for instance, um, because it was all about the Merovingian lineage, and 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 that had been overcharged with privileges. I mean, it's already uh, under the Merovingians that certain uh, a certain uh, kind of holiness of of the Western Frankish um, uh, mm, uh, monarchy had been created. Um, and, and, and among these things was also this uh, Roman vicary of the Gauls, of the Gallia, um, so the various uh, parts of Gaul in practice, um, that had been conferred by the Eastern Roman emperors. And, and therefore the Merovingians already kind of felt themselves uh, as a bit as the heirs of the Romans. And so the Carolingians did feel like that. And 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 that idea that, uh, that, that there had been an empire and that uh, they uh, it was profitable to consider themselves as really uh, Roman in practice as a public power w was definitely living throughout all these periods. It's not that Charles Mann, Charles Mann came from out from the mists of uh, the pure Germanic world uh, out of nothing and uh, once by chance by by mistake was crowned by the Pope as Roman Emperor. Absolutely not. This was really something overplanned that was still in the air from a long time. 
definitely what happened in, the, in those circumstances of the crowns, the crowning of Charles the Great and all, it was something that could have, might have not happened. If anything, if, for instance, the same Charles um, rose to, 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 mm, to power and uh, arrived to that point just because he, uh, his mm, brother had died, so it wasn't uh, that normal uh, that average, uh, it was uh, just in one of those mm, uh, coincidences for which the Franks weren't uh, uh, slaughtering among each other that the Carolingian Empire basically flourished. There even in there, there was nothing teleological in practice. Um, Charles uh, Charlemagne and Louis uh, the, uh, the Pius were actually quite lucky in the sense that all their brothers had passed away. Um, and, and the Franks never, ever understood that they didn't have to split up their properties equally among the various sons. Uh, so at every generation they fragmented the empire. During the Carolingian times they tried to, like, yeah, give a bit more uh, an orderly fashion to this, maybe to the mate, to the first born or uh, um, to the first born, uh, let's say, the, the, the bigger thing, and then maybe to the others, um, smaller uh, entities. This is how Charles the Bold, for instance, rose to power progressively, so like <laughs> eventually scrapping to, to, to the top. But, um, and also because the, the Franks had loads of concubines. I mean, the Frankish kings were uh, had... Mm, I think hundreds of illegitimate sons. So there was also this really, and you can understand how this th this power was con still conceived in spite of all the Carolingian efforts um, f for centralizing the public authority, um, uh, centralizing power it, it as a as a familiar thing. Uh, even the Carolingians uh, inherited, we can say, this Merovingian l legacy but definitely was still the Roman ideal that survived as, in, in this sense, as the Pars Occidentis, because, and, and in this sense, I think uh, one freaking um, important thing I is to even picture um, the, the, the Frankish perspective here in relation with the Byzantines, because uh, even here, as Westerners, sometimes we like to separate, uh, the yeah, that's as if the, the Byzantine Empire was something far away, we don't care all about Northern Europe and that was the West. No, that's not how it worked. The Byzantine Empire was definitely the, the most important um, lighthouse that existed, let's say, politically speaking, in, in, in Europe at the time. Um, Byzantine influences are present everywhere in Europe, including Anglo-Saxon England. Um, in, in, in the, um, relatively to the shaping of public authority. Uh, we find, for instance, the title of Basileus used sometimes into, into the English um, monarchs uh, <laughs> during the Anglo-Saxon period in their mm, documents and all, which is something amazing. <laughs> I mean, not even Imperator, but Basileus in, in the Greek fashion. So th you can understand. The Visigoths, by the way, wanted to create, even throughout their um, um, local uh, Iberian councils, wanted to basically replicate the ecumenical counc councils of Constantinople. Spain was, was another place into which um, the monarchy, uh, if it had not crumbled in practice, even before the uh, the Arab conquest, um, was definitely directly imitating the, um, cons uh, the, the the imperial models of Constantinople, like they were even taking their uh, Roman <coughs> public authority together with their Germanic ethnic authority of gods. The Longobards never did anything like this. Like the Longobards remained totally Germanic in their institutions. They they considered themselves always as Longobards, not even remotely as Romans. Just in the last times when they conquered certain Byzantine territories, they claimed to be protectors of the Romans, but just as Germanic rulers in this sense. Um, so mm, we can't talk really much about them in this sense. Um, and also because they had been fiercely opposed to the Byzantines, um, maybe, uh, among one of the reasons. Um, 
but really the Franks al al always acknowledged that there was Constantinople. I mean, they, they never even stopped remotely to, to know that it was there. And, it, and this was true for, for, every, uh, for every Roman and Germanic counter of the West. So that was the empire point. It's not that those Germans were reasoning as if, you know, we're uh, simply Germans. Well, what's the Roman Empire? Hmm? Have you heard of that? Oh, oh, I don't know. No. They knew always that it was an empire. That the Germans knew <laughs> that it was an empire ever since uh, <laughs> Caesar uh, kicked out Ariovistus um, from, from, from Gaul. Um, and they never forgot that. And the Roman Empire was seen, even during the migration era, like the, the only safe harbor, even for the Germans, into which they could uh, enter as sort of partners, so sharing their sharing power and all. And they, they got legitimization from Constantinople through these things, like when, uh, I don't know, when Theodorigus invaded Italy. Uh, I mean, the Ostrogoths were sent there in the name of Constantinople. Uh, and the same we have seen with the Vicary of, of Gauls um, for Clodoveus. Um, so uh, the prestige deriving from the Roman public authority was definitely always looked at with great, with huge lust uh, by the um, Romano-Germanic kings, because they knew that given the mm, fragility, let's say, of their uh, of the Latin Germanic political uh, structures, uh, um, uh, um, an authority like that could really strengthen up their 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 rule, um, and this well before Charles the Great. Normally, uh, normally uh, people start reasoning in these terms, historically speaking, like r r because mm, yeah, at a certain point the Carolingians rebuilt this imp um, uh, this Frankish empire uh, in, in the West, and therefore they they confronted with the Byzantines and they started there. No, it was something that really came straight from uh, late antiquity, from the migration era. Um, and, and in this sense, they uh, even more than the uh, legitimization of as single individual vicars, uh, the Roman and Germanic uh, kings definitely looked extremely um, interest, uh, is interested at uh, the concept of, um, of regaining the Western uh, Roman uh, imperial dignity for themselves. There had been, after the split of Theodosius, uh, the Theodosian Empire, the um, Pars uh, Orientalis and the Pars Occidentalis of the Empire. Then eventually the, um, the uh, imperial insignia of, um, uh, of the Pars Occidentis had been re um, uh, given back, let's say, to, to, to Constantinople by Odoacer when he deposed Romulus uh, Augustus. Um, and, um, uh, and from that point, uh, that was a, a juridical sanction that Odoacer also did in terms of sor sort of, uh, in a respectous fashion, instead of usurping the title, really giving the imperial insignia back to Constantinople, but always maintaining himself into this uh, sort of Roman commonwealth um, uh, that existed like, among the G Germanic uh, populations in the West. And um, so that's juridically the moment in which the Pars Occidentis kind of stopped because um, simply uh, the, the emperor's got back the, the Western uh, Imperial Insignia. Eventually Justinian did his uh, work of reconquest and nobody actually from Constantinople thought of reviving the, the Western half. And as you know, the Western half was just an administrative repartition, so there wasn't really nothing an, an Imperial dignity attached to the to the Western half. I mean, it was practically the same Imperial dignity that was um, exercising, it was being exercised by two people at once that had decided to um, to to uh, divide the empire, but the imperial dignity was something uh, unique uh, in this sense. And legally and juridically speaking, it, 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 um, uh, an imperial dignity couldn't be created from nowhere. Uh, it was just the Roman emperor that could maybe appoint another co-emperor that had the same authority. 
therefore that's why we criticize juridically speaking the legitimacy of the Holy Roman Empire in this sense because the Pope wasn't uh, really um, didn't have juridically any uh, power to create another emperor in the West like it happened f uh, with Char uh, Charlemagne and eventually all um, the other uh, let's call them Holy Roman Emperors uh, even as I if um, they, they weren't uh, the Empire wasn't called in that way still um, so the mm, the, the there is an ambiguity that obviously existed uh, from Charl uh, from from Charlemagne onwards, which was pretty obvious because of the uh, f of what we just said. Um, the um, the uh, and and that was, however, and this is the important thing, vaguely but still possibly related to the ancient. <laughs> uh, imperial authority that that had existed uh, in those same uh, in those same lands, by the way, and it was uh, in this sense felt or you know mm, pretended to, to to have been uh, universal mm, and still superior to those uh, authorities. Uh, to those royal authorities of uh, of barbarian origin. Mm. So this was also the big thing that it was a crown that uh, mm, was uh, over all the others in practice. So it wasn't just the Pope crowning someone Frankish Roman em Frankish Emperor. It was crowning uh, Charlemagne Roman Emperor. So something that went beyond practically any other title on earth. Um, if not another Roman title like the one of Constantinople, and and this is why uh, still during the 10th century when the Renovatio Imperi took place, the popes kept to attribute um, the the imperial crown even to a series of noblemen, like the one of the Kingdom of Italy that were all but powerful and and worth <laughs> that we can say because they were very small powers like I don't know the, the Duke of, uh, of Spoleto or the um, the Marquis of uh, Verona or maybe Hugh of, of Provence um, that came from the Bur Burgundian uh, kingdom by the way. They were small powers, they had a kind of a local power, not more than uh, definitely not even regional at that point. The one achieving that once again was just um, uh, Otto the Great uh, from Saxony. but. Um, the the important thing in this sense is that the pont the Roman pontiffs could um, safeguard the principle um, that basically uh, wasn't recognized in Constantinople mm -hmm. because in Constantinople first of all the Pope was just the, the Bishop of Rome and uh, um, yeah he was the patriarch of one of the historical uh, mm, seats that had been founded by the apostles uh, of Christ, and the first one in terms of charity, because of of the martyrdom in Rome of Peter and Paul, but essentially nothing else. Um, and therefore, the popes playing on this cr uh, crowning definitely were gaining power in their own uh, in, in turn and not just giving them to the Franks, but definitely being uh, recognized by uh, the, the Franks to them. Um, so, um, and, and the interesting thing also in here is that the Carolingian Empire hadn't concurrence in, in the West. Like, there was no other Romano-Germanic kingdom at that point that could say, oh, well, but, uh, you know, we, uh, you can't give them the imperial title. <laughs> you can't give Pope, you can't give the imperial title to Charlemagne. Uh, because there was literally no one that could do that. Like uh, the the uh, uh, Spain was Arab uh, at that point. We're just a bunch of uh, of, of Christian um, lordships surviving, struggling in, in the north. Anglo-Saxon England was still, you know, first of all, pretty. Uh, um, it was actually developing its own monarchy, but on completely different bases. 
um, it was still a relatively weak power, and it definitely remained for most of the Middle Ages. Um, the, the 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 Carolingians had in the east had arrived up to the uh, to the Slavic frontier. Um, the the Vikings definitely didn't give a damn <laughs> in there; they, they weren't even Christian. Um, and uh, because this was a Christian empire, of course, uh, given being uh, given uh, by the Pope in practice, uh, uh, the, the the Carolingians had conquered Italy, uh, so there was no one saying contesting that. So this also played in favor of the development of the Holy Roman Empire because nobody could, you know, e e eventually this, the, the guys who contested these crownings were simply other guys that could, yeah, play from those territories that had been, however, formally part of of, of, um, of the Carolingian Empire, uh, the Carolingian uh, dominions, and that um, maybe wanted to be eligible themselves instead than, than the ones that were that had been appointed by the Pope, and there was definitely a lot of competition also in that sense. Um, and um, the um, another fascinating thing that uh, is also difficult to explain, but we will definitely do in another moment because now the video is already too long uh, the way it is, um, is really. Um, that the uh, the Re Renovatio Imperi started from Germany, and not just from a, um, a random part of Germany, but from Saxony. So one of the lands that, technically speaking, had the least um, uh, Christian and Frankish traditions of all. Um, so this happened for reasons that we cannot explain. But w what is fascinating is that eventually um, the the uh, the Western Frankish kingdom kind of lost uh, the imperial title because aside from I think just once I mean uh, just uh, no it was definitely Charles the no they didn't even they even get any uh, they didn't get the crown but theoretically speaking it was still possible that a French ruler could be elected as Holy Roman Emperor. If you take the election of Charles the first, uh, the fifth of Habsburg, even in the in the sixteenth century, you see that here that Francis the first, King of France, was practically just being elected uh, Holy Roman Empire, and he could concur to to that title for that title. Uh, eventually, the Germans elected Charles V, but he he, he could still be a, an eligible ruler because that wasn't really. Uh, a German Empire. It was uh, a universal Roman Empire. So every Christian um, uh, at that time, by the way, the reform had already uh, kicked in. So um, the Reformation was uh, already uh, dividing. I mean, a Protestant would have never <laughs> become um, emperor in this sense. Um, but uh, what is interesting is that uh, the, the Holy Roman Empire was still perceived in many times in medieval history as uh, theoretically um, uh, s uh, a system into which anyone could participate. I mean, Alfonso uh, the X of Castile, uh, 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 about whom I talked about yesterday, by the way, uh, relatively to con the construction of the Castilian fleet, was, for instance, elected, at least, uh, uh, you know, he's telling the truth, his election was contested, but he kind of became king of the Romans, or even, uh, yeah, king of the Romans, and um, the, and, and I mean, there were lots of powers that theoretically could, um, that, that definitely recognized legally, juridically, that institution as still the Western Empire. Uh, okay, uh, it seems like I'm telling you all pretty obvious things in in some ways. I'm, I'm trying really to give perceptions more than anything. Uh, we even didn't talk very much about the Renovatio Imperi as such. Um, the um, but well, yes, uh, I, I wanted to start from the Ottonians, but I ended up to talking about most about the the Merovingians and all. But I think it was. It was uh, an interesting um, talk with you, at least, and I hope that you enjoyed it. 
uh, and if you did please share this video uh, otherwise just leave a like or subscribe to my channel and so that you can receive uh, notifications about my further contents that's what basically subscribing gets to um, and um, and for now I, I thank you heartily for listening to me as always um, I'm very happy to see that there are a couple of people now I have 60 subscribers now I mean someone is interested about what I say <laughs> not so many but I still appreciate you um, quality is definitely more important than quantity um, and as always I, I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye